One small step. We began this series last week. I told you as we got started there that this was a place, the the sharing of your faith, being one that goes with the message that God has given to us first, loving as he's first loved us, is something we identified as a congregation together. This is not a strength of ours. So we're working on taking one small step at a time. And and last week, as we looked at this uh, one small step idea, the encouragement was this. We get to join Jesus in what he's already doing. That as we think about evangelism, that is uh, sharing the good news about who God is and helping people to see that as good news, is that our job is not, because we can't do it, it's not changing people's minds. But let me add to that as well. It is also not a program It is not being an attractional church. It is not even being those who just do a really good job inviting. Let me show you a picture. That is a bridge. Next to it is a river. Anybody see a problem? (laughs) The river used to be in a different spot. This is down in Honduras. Hurricane Mitch, 75 inches of rain that came along. And there was so much rain that came down and so much force of the winds and all that, that the water pouring down, it changed the location of the river. So now there is a bridge that crosses over nothing, dumps you off in a river that you still need to cross. Kind of a funny thing. The river moved, but the bridge is still where it's at. When Holy Cross began, uh, this was a, uh, a bunch of cornfields out here, a few houses in this way. People were starting to fill up the Jenison area. Um, there was a ton of people that were Reformed. There was a ton of people that were Catholic, though I learned it took a while to actually get a Catholic church in the area. Um, and, and in the midst of this space, Holy Cross was planted, and 10,000 doors were knocked on by the founding pastor. and and. People came together because there were many that were searching for a church, and and often those who had maybe a Reformed background and a Catholic background, and they got married, said, hey, we need to find something different, and Holy Cross was a great fit. It was somewhere in between. That's some people's story. Uh, But we had awesome children's programs, and and uh, did did a great job uh, caring for and connecting with people, and people were looking for a space to land as they got planted into this, uh, this new community as they moved and built out here, and the church grew, and continued, and now 53 years later, I wonder whether we're in some ways like a bridge next to a river that moved. Let me give you some stats about our community currently. 60s and 70s, people were looking for a church. Current stats, this is a five mile radius within Holy Cro- from Holy Cross, from this location. When people were asked, this is from 2017, so it's current. To answer the question, uh, either agree, disagree, I don't have an opinion. Jesus is the only way for human salvation from sin. 25% of people flatly disagree. Another 25% have no opinion at all, which only puts 50% in the affirming, at least in some direction. Now, for those of you that say, well, maybe uh, people just have a personal relationship with Jesus and they just don't come to church. Only 55% of our community said, I have a personal relationship with one living God who is my Lord and Savior. And down from that, only 41% are active in a religious community. That's 9% down from 10 years ago. 15% of people that said yes 10 years ago said no today. 6% that said no 10 years ago said yes to that today. I'm now a part of a religious community. Almost 50% said religious involvement is not relevant to my life. When even asked about what the religious preference would be, should they choose to pick something, and they could pick from anything on the map, do you know what the most people picked of any of the ones out there that my preference if I would go to something? None. 25% of people. And that was the biggest group. This one I thought was especially convicting as well. When asked uh, why you do not participate in 
a religious organization, go to, why, why you don't go to church. And to what extent was not being invited a, a critical piece to that? Less than 5% said that was either somewhat or a significant reason for not participating. It's not because they weren't invited. It's not because this wasn't a, an attractional place, that there weren't great programs and things that are happening. 50% of them said this isn't relevant to my life or where I'm at. And if we continue to think of church as the place where we build the program, we do the thing, we invite the people, we're the center of the community and get the community to come in, and if we can just do that, I mean, they're looking for it anyway, so we'll be the place that they want to land, and then we can tell them about Jesus. Friends, that was a model, and it worked for a time, but the river has moved. And maybe initially that's especially scary to us. Man, what do we do now? Maybe for some of you that, that leads to, to worry or, or uh, nervousness in all of that, but let me tell you this. If we look around the room at the people in here and we say, man, what, what are we going to do about this? You should be nervous if that's all you're looking to. But if you look to the one who was in this and is working through this even before all of this, who knew that the river was going to move and has actually already been working on dealing with that fact, Jesus Christ, you realize that, that he's not worried at all. And he's actually been at work and been on mission in all of this and, and preparing ourselves for today. And we get to join Jesus in that work that he's been in the midst of and he's already doing. What is it? I know I alluded to it and I didn't tell you uh, last week about it, but I encourage you to join Jesus uh, where he's at. Let me tell you what it's not first. It's not another commitment on top of your already busy schedule. And it's simpler than you think and more fun than you'd expect. It's seeing Jesus where he's already at work in the midst of your daily schedule and already joining him. We don't actually don't, don't need to do a congregational vote or a capital campaign or hire more staff to do this. But instead, we will see ourselves as missionaries in a mission field along the paths that we're already on. Joining Jesus on his mission is seeing ourselves as missionaries in a mission field along the paths that we're already on. Paths that lead us to work and to school, to practices and to classes, to the grocery store or to the end of your driveway, to your mailbox. Missionaries that don't have to do Jesus' work, that's changing hearts and minds, but joining Jesus in the part that he has for us in this, so that through us and in conjunction with us, he can finish his work in the lives of the people that are along our paths in our lives. There was an image that uh, I shared with you. We talked about this, joining Jesus, the mission that's already in motion. And the verse that I shared last week is this, about the fields that are ripe and this analogy that Jesus taught about that, that there are some who are ready that I've already been doing work and I'm not worried worried about how the river that has moved now, I've still been working in people's lives and, and placing you in places that I need you to be so that I can do the work that I'm going to do through you. And there are some that are ready. Anybody ever done any gardening or anything? D done some gardening? Picked some tomatoes or other fruit out of the garden? Anybody gone apple picking before? It's, it's Michigan. I hope you've done If you haven't, go, go apple picking. They're real nearby. Strawberries? Anybody done strawberries? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you go out to a strawberry patch and try to pick a strawberry that's still green, there's one they're super hard, and if you try to pull it off, it'll almost rip a half the plant out along with it. But when there is one that's ready, you almost have to touch it just gingerly and, and pull it off so you don't squish it in your hands and it pops and the sweet juice of the uh, strawberry juice is on your hands. There's just a huge difference between one that's ready and one that's not. And if you try to pick something that's not ripe and ready, it becomes a disaster. So it seems then that this following Jesus' words here, open your eyes, look at the field, they are ripe for harvest. We first have to understand who is ripe, who is ready for this. And where does it start? Well, Jesus says right there, open your eyes. So it starts with an, an eyes up kind of thing, and maybe that's step one for you, that I just need to be aware that one, the river has moved, and two, that we're in a new place where not everybody was looking for a church. In fact, many of them 
aren't and don't want to? Can we see that there are some who are not right, but yet trust in Jesus that there are some that are? And how do we join him and, and where that's at? How do we know who's ripe for this? Well, let's let Jesus show us. What did Jesus do in his life? What did it look like? Did he build programs and buildings and run events? Or did he hang out with people? There was a time when, when Jesus was coming into a town and then people were excited about what he had done because he'd done healing and, and given sight to the blind and, and I had taught in ways that, that people hadn't taught before and there were crowds that were gathering in and he was coming in along the street and they kind of narrowed in around him and there was a man who was kind of smaller, uh, stout, um, not able to, to see over the crowds and so um, he was uh, trying to find his way so that he could see Jesus. Uh, if you are under the age of eight, you can answer this question. If not, you can't. Who am I talking about? What's his name? Zacchaeus, yeah. How's the song go? Sing it along with me if you know it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. That's my kids, by the way. <laughs> and as that Savior passed that way, he looked up into the tree and he said, What? Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. And what did the people say? He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. People muttered as Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. This amazing teacher, this awesome guy, has come along, and he is going to go hang out with this sinner. What's joining Jesus look like? It's hanging with people. And not just the, the ones that are in the same socioeconomic group, not just the ones that, uh, that are our closest um, to us or, or that we like being with, as Jim talked about here, like, like the suckers. Uh, maybe there are some that, that aren't your favorite that are along your path, and that's who Jesus hung with. In fact, I challenge you to go back and read through the Gospels and look just for this one thing. How often was he accused of hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners? It's quite a bit, and people are appalled at this. There's an interesting question that uh, a guy that uh, is kind of ahead of me on this, uh, Greg Finke, he said, is it that Jesus... Is it because Jesus' mission is so big that he hung out with people like this, or is it in spite of the fact that he had such a big mission that he hung out with people in these ways? Friends, I think it's because of it. Because it's been the most effective strategy getting to know someone right where they're at, meeting them where they're at, knowing them where they're at, and then God is able to, to work in the midst of that. It is something that is, as he coined it, inefficiently effective, which we struggle with. I want to be, I want to be able to make it all happen in as small as time as possible and, and pick the right sucker out of the bin, if you will. I'm going to invest in the right person so it'll actually lead to where I think it needs to go. Beware of that, how you might be too efficient in this. And let this verse guide you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It doesn't say love the ones who are like you or who you enjoy, but love the ones that are nearby to you. And he says, it starts, they love one another. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to us in here, within your own family, within the own family of God, the followers of Jesus. Love here so that the world looks in on the outside and says they actually do care about each other. I might want to be a part of that. But also extend that care to others. And I, I love this phrase, uh, again, Greg Finke. He says, don't just be with people, but enjoy people. Maybe that's a step for you this week, that I'm not just hanging out with people, but I'm striving to actually enjoy being with them. A la Ecclesiastes, make the most of the present, of the here and now. Uh, enjoy what God has given you now rather than uh, expecting what, it's, what you want it to be. Not just with people or tolerating people, but, but enjoy people. 
And if that's your agenda, you're doing what Jesus did. He went and hung out with people and enjoyed being with them, and stuff worked in the midst of that because God was working through him, and the same thing will be for you. That's the agenda. The agenda is is not just, I'm going to be your friend so that I can tell you about Jesus. They'll sniff you out in no time. And that isn't what Jesus did. He loved them because they're children of God, because he died on the cross for them. And you love him as that, and you'll be able to do this next thing. Recognize and respond to what Jesus is already doing in them. Friends talk about what's going on in life and about what's real. God is at work when people are unsettled. When difficulties and worries come along in life, when struggles are in what they're in the midst of, how do you know when they're ripe? How do you know when they're ready to hear? They will tell you. And it won't necessarily sound like, tell me about Jesus, or tell me how you have hope in a situation like this. But it'll be someone that you're in a close enough relationship with because you've walked a long life and you've tried to enjoy life together with them, to to not just know their name but what's going on and, and track with them together, that they tell you about their worries, their struggles, and their insecurities. And loving them the way that God first loved us might look like a listening ear, that you might be the one person in their life that's patient with them for right now, might be the one that you get to show love in just a a listening kind of way or potentially a tangible kind of way. And listen long enough, and you might get to do what good friends do for others that are struggling and say, hey, you know, when I struggle like that, this is where I get to turn. You don't have to do that, but it works for me. I learn and turn and lean on God at a time like this. And even when leaning on him doesn't lead me to getting out of these things, it helps me know in the midst of it that even if those struggles went away and the, the resolve that would come from all that, God has something even better for me down the road, and that ultimately is my hope in all this. And if this makes you a little bit nervous, like, okay, I can do that friendship part, I can enjoy people, Ah, that'll take some work, but this whole telling them about about, uh, where my hope is and all that kind of stuff, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Even though the river moved, if Jesus has been at work in our community, friends, he's also been at work in you, preparing you for this river that has moved. Every Sunday when you hear teaching, every time you open God's word or read a devotional, and you come to understand a little bit more about how God's presence and his power meets you in the midst of your struggle, he is preparing you. Every time we model as we stand together here and bring our requests before God and understand how we can lay those things before him, we're modeling for you what you can do in your daily life and along with friends and their struggles. As you sit here and listen in on the children's message, it is by design that we don't do this just in another space where you can't hear, but intentionally up front where you can. So that through often an object lesson and something that's easy to hang on to, maybe something that's easier to remember than the sermon itself, we teach you how to make God's message simple and palatable, understandable and memorable. And even if you're one that, man, I I can't ever remember scripture exactly or quote it, much less uh, tell you where it's from, there's songs that you sing and you hum on your way to the parking lot or throughout the week that are filled with God's promises. And we do that intentionally because that helps it stick so that when that time comes when you're wondering where to point someone, you might be able to quote a lyric to a song that points them to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God has been preparing you for these conversations. And even if this is your first time walking with Jesus or hearing about this, you already now know more than what you would have or somebody that doesn't yet walk with Jesus. So just share what you know. And whether this is your first time or your millionth time that you've been at a church and been following Jesus, know this. If you don't know the answer, you get the opportunity to share with someone else that being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that I have to know all the answers. And that already, we can take a deep breath and be like, sweet, this is good. And you get to say, look, I don't know. But 
we can find out together. I got a pastor who I know I can trust who's going to help me out in this. So let me see what I can figure out. See, the beauty in this approach as well is that when you're having conversations with people that are already along the path of your life, on your way to your mailbox, your workplace, or your school, you don't have to close the conversation in one time. Maybe it's a conversation that happens over the course of weeks and months. And God's going to be at work in every step along the way. Let me leave you with this. What is your next step to love the way that he's first loved us? Maybe it's in the category of enjoying people, and you'll start with getting to know the names of people around you. Just have your eyes up and notice who is around you and already along your path on a regular basis. Half of them probably don't go to church or have a relationship with Jesus Christ, so they're not too far away. Or maybe it's more the recognizing and responding. Building those friendships in such a way that you're listening for the struggles so that you can share where you turn in your struggles because that's joining Jesus on his mission. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to repent. To turn from doing nothing to feeling good about doing what hasn't been working. And Lord, we thank you for working in the midst of it all, for continuing your mission, even when we didn't see the river moving and continue to stand on the bridge that doesn't cover anything. Thank you for preparing us. Lord, help us to stop ignoring your invitation to join you. Lord, thank you for forgiving us and loving us even when we did. And Lord, we pray that as as you continue to give to us an abundance, though we don't deserve it, that you help us to share even a little bit of that abundance with those around us as we enjoy people and recognize and respond to what you're already doing in them. Gracious Father, by your Spirit, guide us to partner with Jesus. In his name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.